Shalom. We are continuing with the Gospel according to John. We are investigating the Hebraic background of the Gospel, and we are in chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Yeshua knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them until the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. So we have a time stamp here in the chronology. It is before the feast of Passover and the supper is ended. There's a lot of discussion about whether the Last Supper was a Passover feast or was not. The information in the Gospels is conflicting but clearly Yeshua is a Passover lamb. He has to be sacrificed on the day of Passover. Perhaps he was having a teaching Passover with his disciples. He certainly wanted to have a last meal with them, and he explains during that meal, and we'll see how he is inaugurating the new covenant. Now this is just a little piece from the Talmud. After a long treatise on the rules for stoning a blasphemer, Sanhedrin 43a states, on Passover, Eve, they hung the corpse of Jesus, the Nazarene, which they do not call him Jesus, they call him Yeshu, after they killed him by way of stoning. And a crier went out before him for 40 days, publicly proclaiming, Jesus the Nazarene is going out to be stoned because he practiced sorcery, incited people to idol worship, and led the Jewish people astray. Anyone who knows of a reason to acquit him should come forward and teach it on his behalf. And the court did not find a reason to acquit him, and so they stoned him and hung his corpse on Passover Eve. Ula said, And how can you understand this proof? Was Jesus Nazarene worthy of conducting a search for a reason to acquit him? He was an insider to idol worship, and the merciful one states with regard to an insider to, wor to idol worship, Neither shall you spare, neither shall you conceal him, which is a quote from Deuteronomy. 13.9. Rather, Jesus was different, as he had close ties with the government, and the Gentile authorities were interested in his acquittal. Consequently, the court gave him every opportunity to clear himself, so that it could not be claimed that he was falsely convicted. So this is obviously a after-the-fact insertion by people who disagreed with Yeshua, what he did, and what he represented. He did have every opportunity to clear himself in front of Pilate, but that was not his goal. The rest of the story here appears to be made up. It goes on further to talk about his five disciples, who were named Matai, which okay, and then Nakai, and Netzer, and Buni, and Toda. So we see that there is a lot of fabrication in this narration of what happened. There is a lot of important information in the Talmud. There's historical information, and there's information for understanding what the practices were during that day. Whether they were biblical or not is a different story, but they are valid for assessing the practices. Continuing in verse 6, Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Yeshua answered and said unto him, What I do you don't know now, but you shall know hereafter. Peter said unto him, You shall never wash my feet. Yeshua answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Yeshua said to him, He that is washed does not need save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he sat down again. He said unto them, Do you know what I have done to you? So we see that it's very common for the guests to have their feet washed with water. Genesis 18.4 Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. This is Abraham talking to his three guests. In Genesis 43.24 And a man brought the men into Joseph's house, and gave them water, and they washed their feet. And he gave their asses provender, when the brothers come to visit Joseph in Egypt. Luke 7.44 And he turned to the woman, and said unto Simon, Don't you see this woman? I entered into your house. 
You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. So Yeshua was expecting to have his feet washed by the host of the house, but instead he had this experience with the woman who washed his feet with her tears. We see that Yehovah washes Israel in Ezekiel 16.9. Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away your blood from you, and I anointed you with oil. So it is written in Talmud that the custom was, a person must wash his face, his hands, and his feet every day for the sake of his maker. As it is stated in Proverbs 16.4, the Lord has made everything for his own purpose. Continuing in verse 13. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Amen, amen, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I speak not of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. Amen, amen, I say to you, he that receives whomsoever I send receives me. And he that receives me, receives him that sent me. And so it is that we are happy if we do the things that we are commanded. In Matthew 7, 24, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Some centuries later, this saying appears in a book called Avot du Rabbi Natan. A man who does good deeds and dil diligently studies the Torah, to whom is he like? He is like a man who builds a house with a stone foundation and brick walls. So when flood water rises against the walls, that house will not wash away. But a man who does not do any good deeds, even though he studies the Torah, to whom is he like? He is like a man who builds a house with bricks for the foundation and stones for the walls. So even when a little rain falls, the house immediately collapses. So this saying perfectly agrees with the sayings of Yeshua in the Gospels. It speaks exactly in the same language. So now we have to make a choice. Did a rabbi some 100, 200 years after Yeshua pick up Yeshua's teaching and teach it? Or were they both teaching from a common body of knowledge that was known and expounded throughout the community? Yeshua quotes the scripture that speaks of his betrayal from Psalm 41.9. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Concerning the one who is sent and the one who sends him, there is a long discussion in Kiddushin 42 about the question of agency, who is responsible for various acts delegated to another. The conclusion, the conclusion is that the one who is sent is equal to the one who sends. We see it in Mishnah Berachot. And if he who erred is the communal prayer leader, it is a bad omen for those who sent him because a person's agent has legal status equivalent to his own. So Yeshua is making himself in terms of who sent him, the Father, and him being sent, that they have an equivalent agency. They, they both have an equal status in presenting the teaching. Continuing in verse 21. When Yeshua had said thus, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Amen, amen, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Yeshua's bosom one of his disciples, whom Yeshua loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. He then lying on Yeshua's breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? Yeshua answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Yeshua unto him, What you do, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spoke this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Yeshua had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. We're still talking about things that are needed for the Passover supper. This is, all this happens before Passover. 
He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Yeshua said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. As far as the concept of Satan entering into Judas, this is not first century Hebraic concept as we have already talked about. They envision that there is a good inclination and an evil inclination. Resh Lekish says, Satan, Hasatan, the evil inclination, and the angel of death are one. That is, they are three aspects of the same essence. He is the Satan, Hasatan, which means the adversary, who seduces people and then accuses them, as it is written. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with vile sword. In other words, Satan is not a name in Hebrew. It just means adversary. Hasatan is the adversary. That's why you always see it written as the Satan. He is also the evil inclination, as it is written there. The impulse of the thoughts of his heart were, was only evil continuously, which is from Genesis 6-5. And it is written here, only upon himself do not put forth your hand. Finishing from verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither do you go? Yeshua answered him, Whither I go, you cannot follow me, but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Yeshua answered him, You will lay down your life for my sake? Amen, amen, I say to you, the cock shall not crow till you have denied me thrice. So many times when we read the commentary on this, they say it was impossible for the rooster to crow because one may not raise chickens in Jerusalem. The Gemara explains that this is due to the sacrificial meat that is consumed in Jerusalem. Since chickens peck in the garbage, they are likely to pick up items that impart ritual impurity and bring them into contact with consecrated food which may not be eaten in an impure state. So perhaps it is just an idiom that it's early in the morning because that is when the rooster crows. Or perhaps there was a person whose job it was to go through and wake the people up saying, call to prayer, call to prayer, it's time to come to prayer. Until next time, Tasimitai Naim HaShemayim. Keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.